Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who's attending this talk virtually today. My name is Stephanie Willerth, and I'm a Canada Research Chair in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Victoria, like you can see in my slide. I am jointly appointed in our departments of mechanical engineering and our division of medical sciences. And since this is a neuroscience focused conference, I wanted to point out that our division of medical sciences has recently in the last few years started offering a neuroscience grad program in case there are any prospective students out there who might be interested in working with us. Today I'll be talking about how to engineer reproducible neural tissue from pluripotent stem cells and uh, try and describe some of the different types of scaffolding out there available to help you deliver cell therapies for different types of neurological disorders. To start off, since this is the emerging technology section, I wanted to discuss a little bit about what tissue engineering is and define it before diving into my research. So Langer and Vacanti define tissue engineering as using both biology and engineering to develop functional substitutes for diseased or damaged tissue. And you can see an example of this here on the slide um, as an engineered trachea. And usually with engineered tissues, you combine things like cells with biomaterial scaffolds, as well as chemical cues like growth factors or small molecules like retinoic acid in order to replicate the structure and cell types found in those tissues in healthy tissue. And uh, if you want to read more, I actually wrote a book chapter on this, which is available through the Harvard Stem Cell Institute at stembook.org. In terms of the biomaterial selection, you can use both natural biomaterials or synthetic biomaterials. And each of them has specific advantages and disadvantages, and I'll be talking about both of those in my talk today. And depending on your material choice, it's obviously going to influence how they behave when you implant them in the body. And for those reasons, certain materials may be more desirable for certain uh, engineering certain tissues as opposed to others. As this is a neuroscience conference, um, my specific area is neural tissue engineering, and today I'll be talking about our work trying to engineer tissues to repair the spinal cord. Here in British Columbia, we have um, several local agencies which are centers of excellence in terms of developing treatments for spinal cord injury, and these include the International Collaboration on Repair Discoveries, or i which I'm a member of, as well as the Rick Hansen Institute, and both of these institutions are quite committed to trying to find new treatments and cures um, for people who are living with spinal cord injury. And in 2010, the Rick Hansen Institute actually um, commissioned a, a, an extensive survey to determine how many people in Canada were actually suffering from such injuries. And they found about 85,000 people do, do suffer, currently live with spinal cord injuries uh, here in Canada, with approximately 4,000 new cases occurring each year. Here in BC, you really see a dual population uh, where these primarily affect younger males as well as an older population, with uh, typically the younger population be affected by things like um, sporting accidents, motor vehicle accidents, with the elderly population it being more from things like falls. And um, one of the things that came out of this study was that these uh, injuries cause a huge deal of both physical and financial burdens. And so thus, it's important to try and develop treatments for these. And in fact, currently, there's no available treatment to regenerate the injured spinal cord. Most of these treatments focus on post-surgical intervention or um, applying things like steroids or other things to reduce inflammation after these injuries. And this is one of the reasons lots of researchers have been looking into different types of cell therapies for the treatment of these injuries. And in fact, in a little bit, I'll talk about Jaron's clinical trial um, that actually uh, was using a cell therapy in an attempt to um, treat these injuries. This is um, just a slide, since we'll be talking about stem cells and the central nervous system, what sort of cells would we want to make from our stem cells. And there are three major uh, cell types you find in the central nervous system. There are the neurons, your information transmitting units that allow your brain to signal throughout your body. There are lots of different types of neurons, and I'll get into talk a little bit later about what we're trying to what type of neuron we're specifically trying to make uh, for the treatment of spinal cord injury. There are oligodendrocytes, which I'll also talk about with the Jaron clinical trial. These act as insulators, and they wrap around your axons to allow them to efficiently transmit these signals. And then there are also the astrocytes, which serve as support cells, which can both provide nutrients to your neurons and oligodendrocytes. They also play an important role in making up the blood-brain barrier, which protects our central nervous system. My lab works with uh, pluripotent stem cells, which um, essentially these cells have two main properties. One is they can self-renew indefinitely, so they can make more pluripotent stem cells. The other property is they can become any cell type found in the body. 
for a while there, uh, the main type of pluripotent stem cells that were commonly used in research were embryonic stem cells. Mouse embryonic stem cells were generated first in 1981, with human cells being produced much later in 1996. These are derived from the inner cell mass of a blastocyst. And being as this is a neuroscience talk, we're obviously trying to direct these cells down lineages to make neurons or oligodendrocytes or astrocytes. More recently, uh, they found, and this was in 2006, Yamanaka and his colleagues and several other groups reported you could reprogram adult cells using certain factors in order to return them to these pluripotent states. And this was a huge discovery. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for it in 2012. And so this sort of provided a way of getting around this use of embryos to make your pluripotent stem cells. It's a very hot area of research. There's a lot of scientific groups out there who are working on this issues of reprogramming, increasing the efficiency of reprogramming, reducing the time for reprogramming, and so on. As a tissue engineer, what was very appealing about these cells is you could, in theory, take a person's adult cells, reprogram them back to the stem cell-like state, differentiate them down uh, into specific lineages, and generate patient-specific tissues. Just to highlight some of these key differences between our embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells, um, induced pluripotent stem cells eliminated the need to use embryos to generate new cell lines, especially in the United States where I did my uh, training initially. This was a very controversial issue. Uh, for a while there, your stem cell lines were restricted and so forth. And so this provided a way to get around this use of embryos and um, seemed to be less ethically controversial. As I mentioned before, one of the things I found very exciting about these was you can make patient-specific tissues and patient-specific cell lines, and groups in Japan are actually uh, working on making specifically iPSC banks for such purposes. I know a lot of neuroscience groups are very interested in reprogramming adult cells taken from patients with neurological diseases, things like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, so they can get these embryonic stem cell lines and use them as disease cell models. And that's also a, a very interesting line of work, although that's not what we focus on. As these cells have now been around um, for a couple years and people have started to implant these to do in vivo studies, one of the things that has been quite interesting is that some of these iPSC lines actually show a reduced risk of tumor formation compared to embryonic stem cells when you transplant them into animal studies. And this is something that was kind of surprising to come out uh, in terms of uh, why you would use one cell type over the other. And finally, and just to, to highlight some of the possible differences, there's a lot of work going on characterizing the differences in gene expression and the epigenetics between these embryonic stem cells versus our reprogrammed cells, and how close are they, and can you substitute one for the other. In terms of the nervous system, I think this is a really good area to be working in, not just because we're at a neuroscience conference, but because this is where uh, these therapies are actually going to clinical trial. As I mentioned previously, Jaren actually took human embryonic stem cells and used them to produce oligodendrocytes for their pair of spinal cord and actually implanted these into several patients. Um, while they didn't observe any uh, adverse effects, which was, I believe, the purpose of their study, they did shut down due to lack of funding, although they are committed to follow their patients through uh, the course of the study. They've reformed. The this, this cell therapy branch was spun off and has reformed this biotime, and they're trying to essentially bring back this clinical trial. Uh, but it was groundbreaking in the fact that they were actually able to get cells derived from these pluripotent stem cells into people. More recently, advanced cell therapy has been running clinical trials where they've taken um, retinal pigment epithelium cells and used them to treat macular degeneration. And these are, are, have been more promising, and they're actually recruiting a lot more members to these studies. So I think these are two really good examples of um, being able to actually bridge the gap and take um, all the promise that pluripotent stem cells have had and actually start to take them to the clinic. So in terms of induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, it's, it's sort of a similar story along the retinal pigment epithelial cell story uh, the Riken Center for Developmental Biology in Kobe wants to do something similar, but instead of using the human embryonic stem cells, they use the iPSC technology. And they've received approval for this trial, and they are going to start running it, I believe, this year. And so it'll be quite interesting to see uh, how this compares with some of the human work that's already been done and, and uh, the equivalency of these, these studies. But again, uh, just some more evidence that um, these, these uh, technologies are translatable and they are going into the clinic. Where my group comes in is um, oftentimes with these cell studies, you're just directly injecting cells into an injury site or a lesion. And it's not often a good environment for the cells to grow in. And so we try to provide 
a better environment through the use of 3D scaffolds as well as drug releasing scaffolds that can help control the behavior of these cells we're transplanting. And so here's some of our tools we have for engineering our neural tissue. And this is a general overview slide, and I'll be talking about um, some of these specific examples today. So as you can see, we have both our embryonic stem cells and our induced pluripotent stem cells. And my lab actually works with all um, works with both mouse versions of mouse ESCs and um, iPSCs, as well as human ESCs and human iPSCs as well. And so we have all four of those cell lines going. I'll talk a bit when we get into our human cells about trying to standardize the differentiation process using some microwell differentiation techniques. Um, just some more pictures showing what our lab can do in terms of differentiating our cells into neural rosettes. And then where we get into our uh, tissue engineering, we have our biomaterial scaffolds. We commonly use a, a 3D biomaterial scaffold made from the protein fibrin. We have some drug-releasing microspheres, which I won't talk about today, but um, could potentially be useful for some other neural tissue applications, as well as some multifunctional nanofiber scaffolds. And we combine these different cell types with different scaffolds, depending on what areas of the nervous system we want to treat. Um, and we can uh, essentially com combine these uh, depending on application and location as well. And one of the nice things about working with our fibrin scaffolds is they can be polymerized um, at different rates. So in theory, they could be injectable along with our drug-releasing microspheres. Before I get into all of our neural differentiation, I wanted to quickly talk about how stem cells and pluripotent stem cells maintain this pluripotency. Um, because I'll first talk about some of our studies done with mouse cells, and then I'll talk about how we actually translate those to humans and some of the, the disconnects we observe um, between the two types of cells. So uh, in, in maintaining pluripotency, there's a trio of transcription factors that essentially maintain this state. And those are OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG. And they all feed back on each other in order to maintain these high levels um, of expression and maintain this ability to differentiate into any cell type, which is pluripotency. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with the stem cell um, field, just to give you an idea of what the Yamanaka factors are, those factors expressed that are overexpressed in adult cells to reprogram cells, those include OCT4, SOX2, CMYK, and KLF4. Uh, just briefly to review how mouse cells are maintained uh, to maintain their pluripotency, you'll notice, um, I'll show the human slide, version of this slide later in my talk, both of these pathways rely um, on these three signaling pathways to maintain, or on when signaling plays an important role maintaining pluripotency in both mouse and human cells. But you'll notice for the mouse cells, two of the major pathways involve leukemia, inhib leukemia inhibitory factor, or LIF, and um, bone morphogenic protein 4. BMP4. And so these are the two pathways that really help activate those SOX2 and NANOG to keep these regulatory circuits up and maintain pluripotency. The reason I mentioned this is to then we'll start talking about um, how we culture mouse and then how we culture human as humans have much stricter requirements than just um, what you can get away with in terms of mouse cells. So when we culture our mouse pluripotent stem cells, in order to activate these pathways, we actually supplement it with LIF in order to activate that pluripotency pathway. And we also grow them on feeder layers consisting of mouse embryonic fibroblasts like you see here in this picture. And so these mouse embryonic fibroblasts secrete factors that uh, enable these cells to maintain their pluripotency. This is also a uh, media supplemented with serum as well, which um, is not always used with human cells for reasons I'll talk about later. Just wanted to show some representative images. For these studies, I'll be talking about our human or our mouse embryonic stem cell line where R1 cells, uh, which is a very standard mouse embryonic stem cell line we obtained from the NAGI lab in Toronto. We bought our mouse iPSC line from Systems Biosciences as well, and you can see they form nice colonies. And one of the themes you'll see throughout my talk is that anytime you're growing these stem cells, they really like to grow as aggregates, both when they're undifferentiated and during the differentiation process. So now that we have our pluripotent mouse stem cells, how do we actually get them to go into neural phenotypes? It's quite common in stem cell culture in order to grow these cells as aggregates in suspension in order to get them to differentiate. Although in the neural field, people are also now moving towards um, protocols which avoid the use of embryoid bodies. So embryoid bodies are what we refer to these aggregates of pluripotent stem cells that form, usually when they're cultured on non-adhesive plates, otherwise their cells will sit down and start um, growing. 
and then mix the differentiation process. And because of that, we can treat them with the chemical cues we find during differentiation in order to drive them down this neural lineage. So uh, the work I'll be talking about today was we were trying to find a more effective way to generate neurons uh, with an emphasis on, on motor neurons, although we didn't do it for our mouse cells just yet, um, by comparing two different protocols. And essentially, this embryo body formation protocol that uses retinoic acid has been around for uh, quite a, a while. I believe the original publication is from Bain et al. in 98. Uh, and you culture your mouse uh, pluripotent stem cells for eight days. The first four days, you allow the aggregates to form. The last four days, you treat with retinoic acid. Um, more recently, another protocol has come out, where, which is much shorter, which is six days. And in this case, you allow the aggregates to form for two days. And then the last two days, you treat with retinoic acid and a small molecule called pure morphamine. And pure morphamine is actually a sonic hedgehog agonist. So it performs the same role as sonic hedgehog, but it's much more affordable than the protein itself. And this is uh, very consistent with um, some of the pathways that pattern motor neurons during development. So when we were working with our iPSCs, we wanted to see how similar they behave to our uh, mouse ESCs, and we were able to generate embryoid bodies. This was quite straightforward. Um, this work's a couple years old now, but at the time, um, it was right when people were still trying to determine what some of the differences were between mouse ESCs and mouse iPSCs, so seeing that they behave both in culture and would generate embryoid bodies just like our mouse embryonic stem cells was quite promising. Uh, one of the other things we were concerned with was um, we knew these protocols had worked quite well with our mouse ESC lines, so would they work as well with our mouse IPSC lines? And so they did. And so this was just showing that these embryo bodies, once we made them and we, we cultured them, they showed high levels of viability. And this is at the time point for each of them. So at eight days for the 4 minus 4 plus protocol with just retinoic acid, and at six days for um, the protocol with retinoic acid and pure morphamine. We were able to quantify this viability. We uh, use a guava flow cytometer, and you can use an assay called Viacount, and this will tell you how many of your cells are viable in culture. And for all of these, and actually this is an extended time period, um, so the day one is actually the first is um, at the end of this protocol, either eight days or six days, depending on the protocol. And then the day seven and day 14 will be our extended cultures when we actually put them inside of our biomaterial scaffolds. But essentially, our cells maintained a high level of viability throughout this whole process and all the data I'm going to show, which is quite promising, uh, especially as we hope to someday use these biomaterial scaffolds in order to, um, as essentially a, a scaffold for transplantation. So uh, the 3D scaffolds we seeded these in, and this will be what the first two thirds of my talk um, focus on, we use this biomaterial called fibrin. And uh, I'm sure uh, you've probably heard of this. It's the end product of the coagulation cascade. It's uh, a protein that forms when fibrinogen polymerizes. And this is just a scanning electron uh, micro microscopy photo of how it looks where you have all the long protein fibrils. You see it a lot. Surgeons use it commercially as a surgical sealant. Um, cells really like to grow in it, as I'll show in a minute. And also, um, you can modify fibrin to contain drug delivery systems. And there have been several studies uh, that have shown that when you transplant stem cells with fibrin gels into the injured spinal cord, it really dramatically increases the fraction of cells that survive. And those two studies, one is um, by Johnson et al., and it was in uh, soft matter. And this was transplanting mouse uh, neural progenitors derived from mouse embryonic stem cells into the injured spinal cord. And then a uh, more recent study that came out in cell from the Tuzinski lab, they actually, I believe, used neural stem cells in combination with this type of gel to increase their cell survival rate. So uh, I think it's quite an appropriate material to be working with. And it's important to see that we can uh, essentially extend the compatibility of these scaffolds to be used with um, potentially neural progenitors derived from our induced pluripotent stem cells. To give you an idea of our, our methods, we essentially um, were trying to rec recreate a 3D microenvironment in vitro that would replicate what would happen if these cells or embryo bodies were being transplanted in an in vivo setting. And so in this case, we took our embryo bodies, we would polymerize one layer of our protein gel, we'd add the embryo body, and then polymerize the second layer on top. So these cells were actually seeing a three-dimensional protein scaffold. We cultured them for two weeks with a media change on day three, and we chose two weeks because this is about how long these scaffolds last if you implant them into an injured rat spinal cord. 
And then at the end of our study, we, um, as I already showed, we did viability analysis to see how many of our cells were still alive. We also stained to see what our cultures look like using immunocytochemistry for the neuronal marker TUJ1. And we also did some flow cytometry for three markers, for SOX2, which is a pluripotency marker, Nestin, which is a neural progenitor marker, and our neuronal marker TUJ1. So here's just some pictures showing what these cells look like after seven days in culture, just to give us a, a checkpoint and to see that we were getting uh, neural differentiation from all, all of our cell types, as some studies have reported uh, lower neuronal uh, differentiation efficiency with mouse iPSCs. And so we were seeing some neuronal staining after seven days in our cultures inside. And this, again, is inside of our 3D gels. As you can see, when you take it out to 14 days, you get lots and lots of neurite extension. Um, and you even see sort of sub embroid bodies forming off of some of these cultures as well for both our iPSCs as well as our uh, mouse embryonic stem cell cultures as well. So we're trying to compare both the protocols as well as differences between our iPSCs and our mouse ESCs. So we then, uh, again, using our flow cytometer, we were able to stain and quantify the neuronal differentiation for each of these cell types. And so in this case, what we found is that um, for all the groups, we saw significantly more neuronal differentiation after 14 days compared to seven days, which is not unexpected at all. The other thing was that our protocol that was, was shorter but also involved retinoic acid amphimorphamine, this 2 minus pro, uh, 4 plus protocol, produced significantly more neurons um, at day 14 between both sets um, of groups. So we saw that um, both for the mouse ISCs, this protocol is more efficient at generating neurons, um, as well as for the, the mouse embryonic stem cells. The other interesting thing was that we did generate significantly more neurons when we used our mouse embryonic stem cells versus our mouse induced pluripotent stem cells, which, based on literature, um, was not surprising, but um, was interesting to confirm using our, our setting. And this was also the same um, for the 4 minus 4 plus protocol as well. And so again, this just shows you some of the differences between the mouse, uh, or between the iPSCs and the HSCs. We also uh, stand for the Nestin marker, again, just to, to quantify our system and make sure everything was working properly. And as expected, um, at most time points, we saw a decrease in Nestin staining from day 7 to day 14. And this makes sense as the cells continually uh, differentiate. So there should be less neural progenitors and more mature cells at day 14. And um, again, in this case, uh, we saw less uh, neural progenitors when we used the 4 minus 4 plus protocol compared to our, our shorter 2 minus 4 plus protocol as well. But again, this is all consistent with what we had, had expected to see. Uh, finally, and this is a, an important consideration, is we wanted to see how many pluripotent stem cells were left. And so we used, uh, we stained for SOX2. And one of the interesting things is for the iPSCs, we did see significantly more um, pluripotent cells at day seven, which we did not observe when we used the mouse embryonic stem cells. And one of the reasons for this might be because in our mouse iPSCs, they do have SOX2 being retrovirally expressed, although this does decrease when we take them out to 14 days. Uh, one concern. Um, which is always a concern when you're working with pluripotent stem cells, is that even at day 14, we still had this population where between 8 and 10 percent of the cells were staining positive for SOX2. So that means we still had this pluripotent stem cell population hanging around. And what that translates to in vivo usually is um, the potential to form tumors. And so um, this would suggest possibly if we were going to move into in vivo studies, we might need to sort out these cells before we would transplant them or try and further uh, optimize our differentiation protocol to try and drive this number further down. So, so what we learned from this was our neural progenitors derived from mouse pluripotent stem cells maintained high levels of viability in 3D scaffolds, and they preferred to be cultured as aggregates. Um, in terms of viability, we really didn't see any differences between the iPSCs and the ESCs. And as we expected, the longer we cultured them, we saw a decrease in our immature cell markers, both for pluripotency and neural progenitors, and an increase in neuronal marker expression. And I would guess if we looked for them, we would also see increases in um, the oligodendrocyte markers and astrocyte markers as well. But for this study, um, we've been mainly trying to focus on neurons uh, with a goal towards making motor neurons for transplantation for spinal cord injury. 
Um, our protocol that used retinoic acid and pure morphamine increased the percentage of cells that differentiate into neurons, and we're trying um, to translate some of these protocols for use with our human cells. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, that about 8 to 10% of these cells express this pluripotency marker, which is always a concern because uh, it could potentially indicate tumor formation in transplantation studies down the line. So um, that's, that's sort of the, the mouse story. The next part I want to move on to is how we actually take all this stuff we've learned from our mouse studies and translate them into human work. And so one of the big challenges with human cells is you can't just grow them on mouse and well, you could grow them on mouse and brain your layers. Uh, it's not advisable to grow them in animal products for several reasons. And then how we can actually make this differentiation process, process more reproducible um, so we could actually potentially someday take these therapies to the clinic. And so I'll talk about, um, first of all, our culture conditions, then how we induce our neural differentiation, and then some of our bioactive scaffolds that could hopefully uh, ensure we could replicate these effects in an in vivo setting. So uh, as we move from mouse to humans, uh, one of the things we've been focusing more on for our human studies is looking at induced pluripotent stem cells as they seem to be a more clinically relevant source for our transplantation studies. And so that's what I'll show a lot of our data from for our human work has been mainly with these uh, human induced pluripotent stem cells. As I mentioned before, human uh, to maintain pluripotency of your human cells is quite different than from your mouse cells. And in this case, again, you'll see lint like I've talked about before, but we also have uh, FGF2 and activin, which these are the two major pathways you need to hit in human cells in order for them to maintain their pluripotency. So originally when people derived human pluripotent stem cell lines, they were uh, grown on the mouse embryonic feeder layers like I showed, I showed for our mouse pluripotent stem cells. However, studies have shown that human cells will actually take up these mouse proteins, or if you grow them in the presence of serum, they'll also take up these uh, bovine proteins as well. And in theory, if you have these ill-defined culture systems where you have variability in where you get your mouse from, variability in your serum, it's going to lead to more variability in their differentiation potential. The majority of people uh, working with human pluripotent stem cells today are usually working with a combination of defined media, usually uh, m teaser, uh, with matrigel as the coating to grow their cells on. And matrigel is a mix of extracellular matrix proteins that are secreted by mouse cancer cells. So again, you have this mouse protein issue that's present that must be dealt with. And so in the last few years, a lot of groups have reported how they can use chemically defined surfaces with media it's also defined in order to get away from using these animal-derived products. And we, in fact, tested some of these products as part of our collaboration with stem cell technologies here in Vancouver. Um, for all the data I'm going to show that the, the cell lines we've been using, our human cell line is the H9 cell line, which we obtained. Uh, both of our cell lines came from my cell. It's one of the classic cell lines, and we chose it because it's been previously shown to efficiently dif differentiate interneural phenotypes. And if you are working with human embryonic stem cell lines, you should check because certain um, cell lines are more efficient at neural differentiation than others. In terms of our human-induced pluripotent stem cell line, we work with um, the one DL01 line, which is derived from hu human foreskin, and this was published out of Thompson's lab in Science in 2007. So the first surface we had, we had began testing in our collaboration with stem cell technologies was a product called Stemadhere. And as you can see, it's essentially e here in protein. And these activate the F FGF pathway, which we saw maintains pluripotency. And this is just uh, shows how these proteins are mobilized on surfaces that can then be cultured in the presence of media like uh, m teaser m 1 is one of the most commonly used formulations for uh, pluri human pluripotent uh, stem cell culture. Although it does contain bovine serum albumin, it is, it is defined, but it does have BSA. Um, again, cow proteins are not always desirable, as well as basic fibroblast growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, and some other uh, defined substances as well to keep your cells pluripotent. Uh, at the time, these uh, technologies were quite new, so there are questions of can we actually thaw cells directly into these media, how long does it take to passage, how does it compare to culturing these cells on things like MAPS, like Matrigel. And so here are just some pictures when we grew them in defined culture, and uh, both our, our human 
ESCs and IPSCs behave quite similarly when we're using these defined conditions. We did some staining um, just to see how, how pluripotent they were, and we found when we, in this combination, about 40% of our human-induced pluripotent stem cells were SSCA4 positive, which is a pluripotency marker expressed by uh, human cells after one passage. So this was quite low, so it's a bit disappointing. We also stained for SOX2, and we got higher amounts of SOX2 staining. About 62% of our human IPSCs were um, SOX2 positive, but again, these were our IPSCs, and SOX2 viral expression may have been influencing, uh, causing these counts to be higher than what it truly could be. Uh, while we were working on this project, they actually came out with another product, which was based on the protein vitronectin, uh, which is a glycoprotein found in serum, and so instead of using the stim adhere, e adherin method, um, they focused on these glycoproteins, and it's a common ECM protein, and Essentially, you coat your surface with it and grow your cells on it. So we were then going to try this uh, next in terms of our defined conditions. We also came out with a reduced uh, a media formulation called TSER8, which actually got rid of the BSA and drastically lowered that protein content. So now we're getting towards more defined systems that we were previously working with as well. So we essentially repeated all those experiments, but with this media combination. So here we actually saw a really high level uh, pluripotency. So for our SSEA4 positive marker, about 98% of our cells were positive. So these seem to be much better at maintaining our cells in a pluripotent state compared to our, our other combination of that stem adhere and in teaser one And again, we saw high levels when we looked at SOX2 with about 83% of our uh, HP, HIPSCs being positive for this pluripotency marker after passaging. So this is the system we've been working with and, and we currently use for all of our cultures because it's defined, it has the reduced protein content, and it maintains really high levels of pluripotency. Uh, although I didn't talk about it too much, we actually can thaw and maintain, as we do in our lab, um, our pluripotent stem cells in completely defined conditions Previously, um, stem cell technologies had recommended you thaw onto either a MEF or a matrigel and then transition, but we've had uh, no problems actually just thawing directly into these defined systems. And we do find that, that our pluripotent stem cells proliferate better and maintain higher levels of plur pluripotency when we culture them on this vitronectin t 8 media combination. So that's, that's um, talking about how we were uh, engineering reproducibility into our pluripotent culture. Now I'm going to talk about how we switch and differentiate our cells into our neural progenitors and try and keep this process uniform. And we use this their technology also from stem cell technologies, which instead of relying on non-adhesive plates, they have non-adhesive microwells to form uniform embryoid bodies. And so essentially um, what you end up getting is a bunch of aggregates that are all the same size with approximately the same cell number. So you have your agarwell plate, and for us, again, because we're trying to do neural differentiation, we use stem cell technologies, proprietary neural induction media. Um, so when these cells are being cultured in these non-adhesive walls, they're exposed to these neural in inducing factors. And essentially, you end up with 300 neural aggregates with between 4,000 and 5,000 cells per aggregate. In order to form neural rosettes, you can seed all of these neural aggregates into a six-wall plate, and then they'll form neural rosettes. I'll show you what happens when you actually take one of these neural aggregates and put them in a 24-well plate, both on laminin, and we've done some work where we've seeded these into fibrin as well, and, and show you some of those results. Just to give you an idea of what these look like, here you can see the microwells. This is after five days of culture, and you can see they form nice um, spherical neural aggregates at this point. And I call them neural aggregates because, as we've found, they tend to um, differentiate 100% into neural lineages cells. As I mentioned, if you culture these, once you have all your rosettes, or you have all your neural aggregates, if you culture them in a six-wall plate together, then they begin to form rosettes seven days. So five days of aggregate formation, and seven days post that, you start to see these neural rosettes, which are essentially your mini spinal cords, and you can actually select out for these, which we've, we've done in some cases as we try to get a pure population of neural progenitors associated with the central nervous system. Here's what happens when you see single neural aggregates on laminin. So this is in a 24-well plate, and it's the only neural aggregate in the well. So this is when you have 300, you get neural aggregate, or you get neural rosette formation. When you see single neural aggregates, you just get a lot, and you'll see a lot of neurite outgrowth that stays positive. Again, this is for the neural marker TUJ1. 
And so it's, it's quite interesting to see the effects of crosstalk when you have all these progenitor cells together. We did seed some neural aggregates into our fibrin scaffolds, and we did some optimization trying to find what concentration of fibrin these cells like to grow in. Uh, for reference, all the mouse work was done at a concentration of 10 mg per mil um, for our fibrin scaffolds. Uh, to give you sort of a reference, when you use fibrin surgical glue, that's usually up uh, much higher concentrations, like 80 to 100 mg per mil. Uh, as you can see here, um, they are quite, this is actually a viability assay. So there are the face contrast photos on top, and then the, the lower uh, boxes. Green cells indicate viable cells, red cells um, are dead cells. But again, we had high levels of viability, and in this case with these neural aggregates, we did see the cells growing out and infiltrating our fibrin gels. We were able to quantify this, and similar to our mouse studies, we saw between 80 and 90 percent viability. And this was also similar to levels. We did this all in comparison to growing these on, on controls, like I had previously shown. We also uh, did some neuronal staining. And so um, as you can see, that you can start to see some of these cells have actually differentiated out and extended processes in the different concentrations of fibrin gels. And we're able to do some, some quantification. Uh, obviously, we'll need to replicate this. But what a preliminary looks like is somewhere between the 8 megs and 12 megs per mil of fibrin really promote um, more neuronal differentiation or similar levels to our laminin compared to the very lowest and the very highest concentrations of gels. Intriguingly, uh, so when we actually tried to select out for these neural rosettes, and we seeded neural rosettes as opposed to uh, the neural aggregates. So the neural aggregates were done just after uh, we're putting the fibrin gels five, after that five-day induction period in the neural induction media. And then they grew fine and, and infiltrated this. And so this would be um, neural rosettes selected after an additional week after they've made those rosettes. And we specifically selected out the rosettes. Um, the cells remained viable when we cultured them out for, for two weeks. But they didn't really ever infiltrate the gel. And so it was almost like going at uh, seeding these later, uh, these more mature cells, they weren't as likely to, to enter the gel and wanted to remain as an aggregate. So that was quite interesting to observe. So we're continuing to work on this and optimize these scaffolds for our human pluripotent stem cells. And um, one of the things we found is that our fibrin con concentration does influence differentiation. And we need to, to work on that to figure out what's optimal to get our, our maximum neuronal differentiation. The cells differentiate more efficiently on 2D laminate surfaces than our 3D scaffolds, um, but we can possibly fix this if we can optimize out our parameters. And this issue with trying to figure out seeding time and how to get more mature neural progenitor cells to migrate into our scaffolds is also going to be a challenge. And it's something we're looking at is, is what's the optimal time um, to put these cells in our gels for transplantation. So for the last bit of my talk, I'm going to, to switch gears from all of our, our fibrin work and talk a bit about synthetic scaffolds and more of the drug delivery aspects of our work. So a synthetic scaffold is usually uh, chemically synthesized, and these pro scaffolds have a lot of desirable properties. Um, for example, you can get a larger range of mechanical properties when you work with a synthetic scaffold and a larger range of degradation rates. So with fibrin and most other proteins, um, and uh, polysaccharide-based gels, you're really looking at uh, very relatively short degradation times. You're looking at weeks, maybe months, if you get some chemical cross-linking in there. Whereas for synthetic scaffolds, you can easily get polymers or polymer scaffolds for the last months. And this gives you some more properties to play with, both in terms of mechanical properties, but also in terms of drug delivery. So if you think about spinal cord injury, you're really looking at a, a healing time course of months. So if you have a scaffold that can deliver drugs over this time course of months, it's really going to be advantageous compared to fibrin, which only lasts about two weeks. So even if you have a successful drug delivery system, if your protein scaffold's degraded after two weeks, then that's going to max, that's going to be the maximum time course you can deliver drugs. Uh, another thing which I'll talk a, a bit about is you can tailor your synthetic scaffolds into specific shapes and give them different properties. Also, they have known chemical compositions, so you can uh, design your chemical polymer to have a minimal immune response. And also, when you work with things like proteins that are derived from blood, they have inherent variability, and sometimes you have to worry about lot-to-lot -lot variation. 
and, and shown here in the scaffold are two of our different drug releasing synthetic scaffolds. The first one um, are nanofibers, which have uh, incorporated in protein drugs. And the lower picture, although I'm not going to talk about it today, is um, our group has established microparticle technology that releases drugs also over extended time periods as well. The, the polymer we've chosen to work with is poly-E caprolactone. And uh, one of the main reasons we've chosen to work with this, you can see it in the lower uh, corner, it's essentially a bright white plastic, is that it lasts a very long time in, in an in vivo setting. And for a lot of our neurological disorders, such as spinal cord injury or Parkinson's, you want a, a drug release system that's going to release drugs over months. And so that's what we've been trying to get at with these um, polycaprolactone scaffolds we make. Also, it's biodegradable. Eventually, um, as I mentioned before, it's one of our synthetic polymers. It's FDA approved, and a lot of times people use this for surgical sutures. You can also fabricate into a variety of structures, as I'll show. It's quite easy to work with, and it's quite affordable as well. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is we make these uh, scaffolds that are made of nanofibers through a process called electrospinning, which I'll get into in a second. Electrospinning is a very versatile technique. It's become quite popular in the last decade. Um, it's quite easy to set up, and you can fabricate these scaffolds from any sort of polymer as long as you can dissolve it in solvent. And um, as you can see along the bottom, here's some of the, the examples of our scaffolds and, and why they are desirable. So uh, A is just a, a randomly collected electrospun scaffold. In B, you can see we've actually aligned our nanofibers, so now they have directionality and topography. In C, as I've shown before, we've actually spun in protein drugs into our scaffolds as well, so they can be drug releasing. That's obviously something we're very interested in. And indeed, just shows some of our mouse induced pluripotent stem cells that have actually been cultured on a polycaprolactone scaffold. So um, that's another nice thing about these scaffolds, is they do support stem cell culture, as it would be. Um, not appropriate to choose polymers that stem cells don't want to interact with, which you can often run into with synthetic polymers, are um, scaffolds that aren't necessarily compatible with stem cell culture and often need to be functionalized with other things like proteins in order to get them to bind. So the type of electrospinning I'll be talking about today is called solution electrospinning. And for example, for poly caprolactone, you have your, your polymer that then needs to be dissolved in a solvent in order to give you a solution. And that's pretty standard for, for any of these electrospinning processes. If you want to actually include your drug, you often um, can emulsify it in this polymer solution. Or there's other ways um, of actually uh, directing your polymer solution where you have essentially an outer core layer of polymer and an inner layer of drug as well. But for ours, it's uh, usually been emulsion-based uh, solution electrospinning to produce our, our scaffolds. So once you have your polymer solution that contains your polymer solution and any drugs you want to include, you then um, essentially have this electrospinning setup, which you have a dispenser, and then you have a polymer collector, which will collect your scaffold once it spins. Um, there's a high charge, so your both your dispenser and your collector are highly charged um, to about uh, um, to very like 110 kilovolts. This causes your polymer solution to be drawn out and it starts to spin and you can collect it on your plate. If you don't do anything special about how you collect these nanofibers on the plate, they'll appear randomly like I showed in the last slide. You can collect them on a spinning drum and it will actually cause them to align. And so then in that way you can start to get some of your topography as well, depending on how you collect them. Although I'm not going to talk about today, there's other ways you can an electrospin with it, avoid using uh, solvents, which is called melt electrospinning, which our group is also involved in. In that case, you just directly melt the polymer, and then you can direct right out what sort of topography scaffolds you'd like. So how can we control neural differentiation using these scaffolds, knowing we have these two parameters, the topography as well as chemical cues? So uh, we did two things. First, we wanted to show we can produce different topographies using our electrospinning setup. The second part was to show we could incorporate in small molecules into these scaffolds and then actually get these molecules out over the time course we desire. And so our goal was to get a multifunctional scaffold that presented both physical and chemical cues. And one of the reasons this has been so difficult to do previously is anytime you add in a chemical cue to a solvent, it affects the properties of your polymer solution. And oftentimes, it makes things harder to spin, which is why, uh, if you'll recall, when you saw um, the different types of scaffolds, the ones that had very nice topography and very straight nanofibers, those were spun from pure polymer solution, whereas the protein-containing ones were, um, had different uh, sizes and appeared to um, 
have different radiuses at points because of the effect of the protein on the polymer solution and changing its properties. And so here you can see those again. Uh, in our group, we've spun both randomly oriented nanofibers as well as LAN, uh, aligned nanofibers. And these are our blank scaffolds. This was just using pure PCL and just trying to show that we could get some nice topography achieved. And these are scanning electron microscopy photos. Some work I had previously done uh, back when I was at Washington University, we had shown that if you take uh, neural progenitors derived from mouse embryonic stem cells and seeded them on these randomly aligned scaffolds, the cells would migrate out in all different directions. And you also see this a lot, not just with our synthetic scaffolds, but also with our fibrin scaffolds. The cells will migrate out in all directions. However, if you use these aligned scaffolds, you actually get really nice neurite extension that moves uh, along these nanofibers. And this starts to get a directionality. And for spinal cord injury, this could potentially be useful if you could implement this in an in vivo setting to actually orient your neurons to migrate down the nanofibers and give you more directionality as opposed to having your cells migrate out and form a mesh over the injury site. So this could be one way to start um, getting some higher order into your tissues that you're engineering. The other aspect, which we were working on um, simultaneously with this, was trying to incorporate drug release into these polymer scaffolds. As I mentioned before, for our spinal cord injury studies, if we could incorporate the drugs into the PCL, this is going to give us a longer time course to play with. And potentially, you could have different formulations of PCL scaffolds to release different drugs over different times. And so by having a PCL scaffold that can release drugs over months, this is quite uh, valuable in terms of treating spinal cord injury. Uh, release from these scaffolds is usually based on the diffusion characteristics, and we'll, I'll talk about the, a bit about that in a second and how large your nanofibers are. And for these studies, we used retinoic acid as our small molecule of choice for several reasons, and it's quite affordable. We wanted to work out our electrospinning process before moving to more expensive proteins, and you can detect retinoic acid's release uh, colorimetrically um, using spectroscopy, so it's also quite easy to detect, as opposed to with proteins where you need to use ELISAs. So uh, some of the first work from my group was just showing that you could actually spin these retinoic acid, uh, retinoic acid into PCL. And we wanted to also see what we could do to different doses. So this would give us another parameter to play with. So we'd have our topography, the drug we're delivering, and then the concentration of the drug we're delivering. And so again, you can see that these are, um, although uh, a lot of them are straight, you do see some Kirby uh, nanofibers that are just due to the incorporation of these bioactive agents into our scaffolds. We also were able to collect these on our spinning drum in order to get towards alignment. And so again, at three different rates, we were able to get varying degrees of alignment for our scaffolds. We also went through and we wanted to characterize these. So as I mentioned, when you change the properties of polymer solution, you also change the properties of the nanofibers that are getting uh, spun out during the process. So one of the things you'll notice for both the aligned and randomly oriented scaffolds, so if we just look at the blanks, and overall trends, the line fibers tended to be bigger, which is probably a function of being collected on that rotating drum. And um, then you'll also notice that any time we incorporated in our retinoic acid, and we've also seen this trend, although I won't show it today, for uh, the proteins, any time you incorporate in a biologically active agent, you also tend to get thicker fibers as well. And the more, uh, and when you add in these agents, you also tend to increase variability as well. So that's sort of summing up uh, this whole process and what the effects are of incorporating your, your bioactive agents in, and also aligning them. So essentially, the more bioactive agents and alignments can increase your size and variability. And this, is, this sort of sums that up. Anytime you add retinoic acid, you get an increase in nanofiber diameter. You also get variability. Um, and in general, the aligned fibers were larger than the randomly oriented fibers. We did some release studies, and I'm just going to show briefly. Uh, we did these also for the randomly oriented scaffolds, and we got similar results. So we found that um, in two-week studies, we were getting about 9 to 15% of the retinoic acid being um, of, the, of the total array loaded in these scaffolds being released at two weeks. So this suggests we could get release over months. And at this point, uh, we were looking at specifically the 0.2% the scaffolds, because they seem to be the most reproducible for both the uh, randomly oriented group and the aligned group. So we chose to further characterize these uh, as well. And I think these are the ones that deliver um, the amount of retinoic acid that would be most relevant to our studies we previously conducted as well. 
And so when we took these out to 30 days, again, we saw between about 8 and 17 percent um, of the retinoic acid being released at this time point. And curiously, we saw that the randomly oriented scaffolds uh, released more retinoic acid by the end, although that makes sense if you think that the fibers are thinner, so they should have a much higher rate of diffusion as well. And uh, it was slower from the aligned scaffolds. And again, there was some, um, some variability, but in general, this is going to give you, so this is a month, so if you have similar trends, you should be getting released from these scaffolds for uh, a couple of months, hopefully at least. We wanted to then, so we had gone back to working with our mouse for these studies, and we wanted to just see again if we could uh, quantify the viability on all four of our scaffolds. So we cultured our mouse embroid bodies. These were made using the sonic hedgehog, um, the retinoic acid, and pure morphine differentiation, the six-day protocol. And we seeded them on each of um, these scaffolds, both the blank ones and the retinoic acid releasing ones, and we were able to quantify um, the amount of viable cells. So again, red cells are dead, green cells are alive, and we have uh, a device called the Incusite, which is a live cell imager, which also does fluorescent cell imaging that allows us to quantify the mean intensity for each of these samples, and you can see that there are high degrees of viability for all of these. On the aligned scaffolds, the inward bodies tended to become longer and migrate again, like we saw with the mouse embryonic stem cells, they tend to migrate along the nanofibers and sort of become more spread out, whereas on the random scaffolds, they migrate out in all directions as well. Also, on the retinoic acid scaffolds, they tended to um, have more cells growing, and this possibly could be due to the fact that we're releasing bioactive retinoic acid as well. We also wanted to see if they differentiated into neurons when we had seeded them upon these scaffolds and uh, try and get at some of that quantification. And again, you can see that um, for the aligned scaffolds, the cells also tended to migrate um, along these nanofibers as well, both uh, in the phase and when we've stained. This is again for TUJ1. And um, again, you see cells migrating in all directions when you have these randomly aligned scaffolds as well. So this was just showing that we could get the differentiation of these progenitors into neurons when we had them on our scaffolds. So um, conclusions from this portion of our study is we could obtain controlled release of retinoic acid from both types of topography. Um, we found that aligned, aligning the topography contributes to variance in release and slows down the release process. One interesting thing, a lot of times with drug delivery systems, you'll see what's called burst release. So in those drug delivery profiles, you don't see, um, like there you saw almost a, a slow, steady release. Normally in drug delivery systems, you'll see a large um, release of drug initially over the first day or, or, or two or three. And in ours, you didn't see that. So that's, that's useful to know if we're going to actually implement this in a clinical setting for the treatment of spinal cord injury to know that we aren't going to have this initial burst of drugs um, from our polycaprolactone electrospine scaffolds. And we've shown that these scaffolds also support the mouse-induced pluripotent stem cell culture and differentiation, which um, is closely, uh, which follows what we had observed with our mouse embryonic stem cell culture, but it's always good to confirm that it works uh, with these new cell types. And now we're hoping to apply all this technology to all of our human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cell technology as well. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the next areas we've, we've been working on, we currently have release studies going on uh, in, in, in this area, is to use these scaffolds to release proteins as well. And so in this case, um, these are actually just some control scaffolds that we've loaded with bovine serum albumin, but we also have currently made scaffolds that release glial-derived neurotrophic factor. And so with proteins, it becomes a little bit more complicated because um, first of all, they tend to, as they're bigger molecules, they tend to have a much larger effect on the solution you're electrospinning uh, compared to small molecules such as retinoic acid. Also, for things like glial-derived neurotrophic factor, you would have to perform ELISAs as opposed to just being able to colometrically tell that your sample has been released. So that's why we've first been optimizing these with bovine serum albumin before moving on to growth factors. The other issue is when you use these solvents, they often can um, inhibit or actually uh, contribute to the loss of bioactivity for your proteins. And so that's another reason why people often encapsulate when they're encapsulating growth factors like nerve growth factor or GDNF, they encapsulate with bovine serum albumin, is to preserve the activity of these proteins so then they can be released in a bioactive fashion when you're delivering your drugs. And so that's, a, so that's why proteins are a bit harder to uh, get out releasing compared to small molecules for these neural tissue engineering applications. 
So where we eventually want to go with this, and I think we're, we're getting closer to there, is to make a hybrid scaffold for controlling differentiation. And so uh, ideally, as I mentioned, each of these synthetic and natural biomaterials have properties that are really desirable. So for example, the fibrin scaffolds are really great at promoting um, cell survival when you implant the injured spinal cord. So it's definitely important to have this fibrin component. But it only lasts about two weeks. So how I picture it working in an in vivo setting is you'd transplant your cells in the fibrin matrix. And this would sort of get them to initially to grow and survive. And then um, once they've essentially degraded the fiber matrix, they'll secrete their own healthy extracellular matrix to grow in. But they'd also be supplemented with these nanofiber scaffolds, which would be delivering drugs over a time course of, of months. And ideally, um, I'm not sure how feasible this will be to implement in an animal study, but it would be nice if we could actually also take advantage of that topography and get ourselves to align uh, in the injured spinal cord in, in a manner where you'd actually get them oriented like they would be found in healthy spinal cord tissue. And then you could have these drug release, uh, this drug being released that promotes the differentiation of your iPSCs into these neurons over the extended time course. And so in that way, when you go in vivo into this harsh injury site that's left by spinal cord injury, you can sort of address some of the issues by getting the cells to repopulate what's normally an, an, um, a harsh injury site with their own extracellular matrix that they secrete, as well as supplementing it with drugs such as anti-inflammatories, as well as delivering cues such as retinoic acid and pure morphamine, as well as other growth factors like GDNF, to get your cells to become uh, neurons and integrate with the existing tissue you have in the, in the spinal cord. And so with that, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab, um, especially Nima Kadima Torum and Amy Montgomery, who performed a lot of the work you've seen here as well. Also, I'd like to thank all of my funding sources, including the Canada Research Chair Program and uh, INSERC for providing a lot of the funding for this, as well as the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and uh, all the other agencies that have supported my work. And with that, uh, let me know if you guys have any questions and I can try to answer them. Oh, so um, I have two questions, which I'll try and answer in the two minutes we have left. Yes, I have thought of translating. Uh, so the first question is, have you thought of translating these two injectable scaffolds? And the answer is yes. Uh, fibrin is, is um, modulated by uh, thrombin and calcium concentrations, so it is possible to make them injectable. And that's definitely a consideration we have. Uh, we'll translate it to that form when we actually move into doing animal studies. Um, when you're working in a dish, it's easier just to um, you essentially have as long as you want for these scaffolds to polymerize, so we work with lower concentrations in that way. Uh, the second question was, do any of your nano scaffolds cross the blood-brain barrier? And um, for these, what we've been mainly looking at is uh, spinal cord injury, so in that case, it's already going to probably be disrupted, or if we're going in post-surgery, you're going to have to, to um, essentially open it back up in order to place the scaffolds in the injury site. For other applications, such as going into the um, brain for other types of neural disorders, we have looked into making injectable formulations, which sort of goes along with the first question, um, in order to uh, get around the blood-brain barrier.